Hey everybody, welcome today. Wayworld Outreach to your overview video. We're in the book of Colossians. This is exciting. And just for a few minutes, we're going to go over some major highlights. Hope you've been enjoying your growth book and everything that God's been doing and teaching you through that. It's a resource we as the church wanted to give to you to bless you. Let's pray and invite the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, we thank you, Lord, as we open up this overview. Thank you in Jesus' name that you're going to tell us what you want to tell us. This new beautiful book called Colossians. This love letter that you left to us, Lord, to tell us exactly what we would need. We give you praise and honor, Jesus, that you are doing this right now. Amen. So, we invited the Holy Spirit. Now let's get into the Word. The Holy Spirit being the teacher of the Word of God. So, the book of Colossians, just a quick overview, was written by Paul during his first imprisonment in Rome. It was around A.D. 60 to 61. And it was really important because the Christians were all under attack. But not under attack the same kind of way of persecution. That was always going on. But the biggest way they were under attack is by false teachers. And these false teachers specifically were coming against the idea of Jesus and the full deity of Christ. Jesus being fully God. That Jesus who had come was fully also totally God. So this was uh, uh, a teaching that was under attack. This was something that we're constantly being. So Paul writes this letter and says, listen, I'm going to remind you of the preeminence of Christ, the all-sufficiency of Jesus, and so I love the book of Colossians so much because it's, like every book, all about Jesus. But there's so much about it describing how he's the fullness of God and just beautiful highlights. We're going to go over those, some of those right now. It's one of my favorite. I'd say it's one of my favorite books of the New Testament. It's in my top two at least. Um, so here we go. Uh, let's start on verse 4 of chapter 1. Once again, we're just going to go over some highlights. Uh, verse 3, we are always thankful to God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. So Paul is really, really thankful for these people. He's thankful for this church because they've really shown genuine love, the genuine love of Christ. He's heard about them. Uh, he was actually writing to them right before he actually had visited them for the first time. And so this was all from what he's heard about them. But he's only been encouraged by the Colossian church. So he says, for the love that you have, Jesus, and the love you have for all of the saints. The love that's in you is the love of Jesus. What a beautiful thing to say. Verse 6, this has come to you, all of the world. This gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and all its truth. So the gospel that I've been preaching, Paul says, is the gospel you have also been sharing it's bearing fruit everywhere. He's trying to encourage them, saying this gospel works. You don't need anything else. You don't need any other um, types of uh, ways of learning or teaching or anything else. Just preach the gospel. Just give them the same thing that I've written to you. Give them the same thing I've been hearing that has been given to you from other people and other churches. This gospel has been reached out to you. And this is the same gospel. And guess what? It's going to bear fruit. You don't need any other methods. You just need to know the gospel and you need to say it. That's a powerful thing for us to remember. Verse 9, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, because you've been doing this, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and you can please Him every single day, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. They're praying for them for the purpose that they can now be empowered to please God. They've already got the word in their mouth. But listen, he's trying to make a distinction saying, listen, you could be a person who has the gospel that's in your mouth, but you might not necessarily with your life actually be pleasing God. He says, we're going to pray a deeper level. We thank God that you have the right message now, but we're praying for your inner strength. We're praying that you would actually be able to live a life in your actions, not just when you preach, but in your actions that would actually please the Lord. You need strength from on high, and we're praying this for you. We're praying that you would be able to live a life worthy that could please God in every way. You're going to be bearing fruit, and you're going to be growing in the knowledge of God. So understand that as we grow in the knowledge of God, we bear more fruit. They come into the same aspects. As you grow in knowledge of God, as you learn more of the Word, who God is. Remember, you're reading the Word to know a person, to know God. It's not just a historical book. You're not just trying to learn about the people in these times. You're learning about God Himself. You want to know a person. The longer and the more that you get to know a person, there is an automatic response 
that as you get to know him, you're becoming more like him, meaning you're bearing more fruit. So the way to bear more fruit, the way to be more fruitful, the way to please God more is to know God more. Do you see that? To please God more is to know God more. We get to know him through his word. We get to know him through personal prayer. We get to know him through intimacy with the Holy Ghost. Okay, so let's keep going. Verse 13, for he, being Jesus, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and he brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. He took you from the lowest kingdom, and he took you and put you on the highest kingdom. Now, you got to understand, there's the kingdom of hell, or what we would call the kingdom of underworld, whatever you want to call it. There's the kingdom of earth. There's the atmospheric kingdom, and then there's the kingdom of heaven, okay? The kingdom of hell, kingdom of earth, atmospheric kingdom, kingdom of heaven. So he took you from the lowest kingdom, and he placed you on the highest kingdom, all with what he did on the cross because of his blood. You've been placed from low. You didn't even have to go through the other ones. You're no longer part of this world anymore. You're no longer part of what the enemy can do in his realm. You're now part of the heavenly realm. You get what the king gets. You get it because now you're a part of Jesus' family. This is so incredible. In whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of all of sin. Those are just some benefits we get. Verse 15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Just listen to these words. This is so incredible. This entire, all of these scriptures are like an incredible, it's like, if you could think about introducing, like if you were to introduce a person at like this big game or whatever the music's playing, and you want to give like a massive, hey, he's coming. This is the intro for Jesus. This is like an incredible introduction speech for Jesus. He, Jesus, is the invis image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. Can you hear it? For by him all things were created, things in heaven, things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. It keeps going. This is so good. Just a huge boastful like speech about Jesus. He is before all things and him all things hold together. He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him. Let's pause for just a second. All of the fullness of the Godhead. We believe in one God, three personalities. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All of the fullness dwelt in Jesus when he came on earth. All of, he was fully man, but he was fully God. All of the God. So when you see Jesus, you see the Father. When you see Jesus sit down, you're seeing what the Father wanted. When you see Jesus speak, it's because the Father wanted it. When you see Jesus reaching out, it's because the Father wanted it. Jesus is perfect theology. Let me say that again. Jesus is perfect theology. Jesus is the perfect will of God in action. He's the will of God in action. He's the will of God in speech. If he didn't do it, it's because God didn't want him to. If he did it, it's because it's God's will. Are you seeing this? So many people lose their vision of Jesus, and they're focusing on so many other things, even Christians. We start getting tied down with this commandment or this one. Well, let's run it through what Jesus did. Let's run that through Jesus. Let's run that belief and see if Jesus agrees with that belief. Let's run with this thing and see if this is actually Jesus or it's a lie, because you can be deceived. But when you run it through the Gospels, take every belief and run it through the Gospels. Well, I believe Jesus makes people sick. What are you talking about? Why don't you run that through the gospel? There's not one time that Jesus made anybody sick. And everyone who came to him was healed. Wait a second. Well, you got to run your beliefs through Jesus. You got to run it through the sifter. It's like sifting out all the dirt so you get the gold and only gold is left. The gospels, Jesus, what he did, he is the perfect will of God. He is perfect theology. You want to run it through him. And through him... To reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you in sight without blemish. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, moved not from the hope of held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard that is Bronco claim to every preacher and every creature. This is so good. Last scripture on, on chapter 1, verse 25. I have become its servant, the servant of the gospel. 
its servant by the commission of God gave me to present to you the Word of God in its fullness. Do you know it's possible to present the Word of God in partiality? You can present a part of the Word, but not like all the Word. You like this part, you don't like that part. Paul says, I didn't do that. I gave you all of the gospel, the fullness. Chapter 2, verse 2. Let's keep going. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart, that you, your church, these people would be encouraged in your heart and united in what? In love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. Verse 3, 4, and 5. Here we go. In whom, in Jesus, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Wow. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in the body, I am present with you in the spirit. This is crazy. And delight to see how orderly you are and how firm in your faith is. He's like, I don't even got to be with you in the body. This is nuts. He said, I'm with you in the spirit. God's telling me what's going on with you. I'm not even with you. The Lord is showing me. He's telling me what's happening with you. Woo! You got anybody like this in your life? Maybe your parents. You went out and did something you didn't think they knew, but God gave them discernment. And every time they saw you, they knew what was going on. You hated that. You're like, God, why do you got to tell them all my business? Right? In whom are hidden Jesus in him are all the treasures, all wisdom, all knowledge. I'm going to read just a couple more verses, but I just want to stop on this for just a second. In Jesus are all the treasures, all the wisdom, all the knowledge. Do you see why lifting up Jesus is the key? Do you say why talking about Jesus, making him the center of your life, the center of your conversation, the center of your message? Not all these other things. They have their place, but Jesus is the center. When you talk about Jesus, you're presenting people with the real treasure. You're presenting them with the greatest wisdom, and you're presenting them with the knowledge that's going to truly help them. Jesus is what you want to speak. Jesus. Speak Jesus. Live like Jesus. Let him be everything in your life. Verse 9, I'm going to read these last couple of scriptures. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. We talked about that. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. So because you are in Christ, you are now with Jesus, seated in heavenly places. You're the head of every power and authority. That's demonic. In him you will also circumcise in putting off the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. In Him, Jesus took your heart and He circumcised you. You've been buried with Him in baptism, raised with Him through faith in the power of God, who raised Him from the dead. Buried with Jesus in baptism. So that's why water baptism is so important. It's so important because it's the symbolism saying my old self is down, it's buried, and when you come up out of that water, it's declaring to everybody else, I'm raised with Him. My life's brand new now. Verse 3, when you were dead in your sins and in your uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins. Last one, last two. These are the last two great scriptures. Ah, I love this chapter. I love the book of Colossians. Having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, Jesus took it away by nailing it to the cross. And here's one of my favorite scriptures of all time. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Do you know when he says them? He made a public spectacle of every demonic power, of every force of addiction, of every force of rage, of every force of depression, of every force of loneliness, of the spirits of suicide, of the spirits of anything that you could think of. Hate. He, he went down. He chained them up on their own home field. Jesus went into hell and chained up the principalities on their own home field. The devil could do nothing about it. And he walked them around hell, literally making fun of it. It said that he led them in a procession behind him. And the Bible says that he was not their slave. They were his slave. Jesus was making a mockery of the very things that are trying to take over your life, lie to you, depress you, um, draw hope from you. Jesus made a mockery of them all. He made fun of them all on their home turf. He taunted them. He showed them that he was the ruler and the king, and that king lives inside of you. Are you hearing me? This is the Bible. This is Colossians 1 and 2. Do you see the power that you have? Whatever you're struggling and fighting against, Jesus 
chained that thing up. He walked it around on the home field of the enemy and he laughed at it and mocked it and they could do nothing about it because they knew who the boss was. His name is Jesus. All authority and power. God bless you today. I'm praying that you have a great, incredible time going through the book of Colossians. This is just the beginning. We'll have new teachers every single week in this beautiful book. And as we move forward, we're praying you're getting a lot from it. Stay in your daily growth book. Stay faithful. Stay committed. This vision of this church is going places, and it's really amazing seeing what God is doing. It's only halfway through the year. How incredible, right? What God has already done. We'll talk to you soon. God bless.